ICQ Podcast, episode 320, Kit Building Tips. Well, hello fellow Amateur Radio enthusiasts and welcome to this, our 320th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast, supported by David Strachan, 2 Mike Zero, Whiskey Hotel X-Ray, Terry Bradford, and our monthly annual subscription donors. In this episode, Martin M1LB is joined by Chris Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Ed DD5 Lima Papa, and Frank Kilo 4 Foxtrot Mike Hotel to discuss the latest Amazon radio news. Myself, Colin M6BRY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a feature discussing kit building tips. Well, as always, guys, it's your uh, very kind donations and your uh, showing the value that you find in our show that keeps us advert free. We'd like to thank first uh, Terry Bradford, who says he's starting to learn the ropes after using a CB as a teenager. Your show is a great to listen. Uh, so thanks a lot. So j- thanks, Dr. Terry. Uh, let us know how you get along with your uh, uh, journey uh, towards getting licensed. And uh, certainly, I say, it'd be great to hear when you get your call sign. David Strachan to Mike Zero, Whiskey Hotel X-Ray. Uh, nice thing, well, nice thing. Thanks all for the great show. So, David, thanks very much. And uh, David and Terry, along with our annual and monthly subscription donors, as I say, they help keep the show advert-free. As always, you can do your bit, uh, as I say, to uh, show your value you find in the show by visiting www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. Well, now we join Martin, Chris, Martin, Ed, and Frank to discuss the latest Amateur Radio news, including Clubs Not Hubs event and new exam rates released. As always, guys, hope you enjoy. Just a quick update. The ICQ podcast has been saying for the last few weeks we're about to attend Hamzilla down near Sandwich in Kent. Unfortunately, I've just had an email from the organisers saying that due to the coronavirus, the event has been put on hold. While most of us hams are extremely upset that this is happening, looking at it realistically, the organisers have taken a very sensible decision by postponing the event. Because let's face it, guys and girls, most of us in the amateur hobby are in in later years in life. So I can understand why this has been put on hold. I know that the organisers were wrestling with themselves before they put it on hold. But unfortunately, the rally that we said we're going to, we won't be there because it isn't happening. So Hamzilla is scheduled or hoping to uh, have run it later in the year. And once again, we're hoping to be there to say hi to you guys. But just to say, it's not happening on the 29th of March 2020. Well, hi guys. Welcome to episode 320 of the ICQ podcast. And tonight's news rounds table for this episode, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Hi, Chris. Hello, Martin. Happy to be here again on a, a wonderful Wednesday in March. Yeah, lovely. And it's not raining at the moment, Chris, which is fairly uh, uncommon. It's, well, let's not let's not let's not, uh, let's not knock that. It's uh, that's a good thing. It certainly is. Also, uh, this side of the pond, there's Mr. Martin Rothwell, who's uh, probably going to do his best to get me into all sorts of trouble. Hi, Martin. I can get you in trouble if you like. We can we can reference what you just had to cut out if you like. But no, let's not do let's that. Let's not, not do that. That would lose our team rating. Yes, yes. Good evening. Good evening. The Martin's call sign is M0SGL. Over in Germany, we've got Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP. Hi, Ed. Yeah, evening, uh, uh, evening, everybody, and nice to be here again. Certainly is. So certainly a good one. And last but not least, uh, my my senior professor, Mr. Frank Howell. K4FMH. Hi, Frank. Hey, Martin and guys. The tulips are about to bloom over here. We're into spring, but it's delightful to be on the ICQ podcast for number 320. Where did the 20 episodes come from? It seemed like 300 was yesterday. I'll tell you what, Frank. I worked out that if we get to 400, I'm going to be about 75, mate. So, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's, um, is it's pulling we we are pulling through quite quickly and uh, 
it is good fun. So 320, yes. Don't ask me how we've got here. I think by uh, a wing and a prayer, in fairness. But uh, it's great to have all four of you with me tonight. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Bill Barnes, N3JIX, uh, couldn't make it. One of the reasons being is that there is a uh, time difference change now in the States. You've uh, sprung forward, and we haven't in the UK yet. So, uh, unfortunately, Bill couldn't make it tonight. He had other things on. First news story, clubs and hubs. Well, a number of you will remember we did a, an article and a, a video, which is up on YouTube, and I believe we run it as a feature, talking about clubs and hubs, about six months ago at the RSGB convention. But uh, Richard, G4JJP, is um, about to set up another conference uh, in mid-Somerset to talk about this, and uh, I think it'll be interesting. Chris, you were with me on the panel on the day. What do you think? Oh, I was, and this is actually moving things forward. So um, it's happening, basically. So we have this uh, mid-Somerset Amateur Radio Club, and they have put forward some, a proposal. Uh, so a number of local clubs are asking clubs to attend. They've sent letters out to chairman different clubs and to amateurs, and, and uh, they're inviting trainers along with having a conference to discuss it, which I think is probably the right approach to uh, get to get people's views in the area. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And they're trying to, you know, it's a bit of a sales pitch, I think, in terms of um, what this hub can potentially offer. Things like uh, the fact that the hub's in the, 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 sorry, the hub is in decline and we can reverse that and uh, what they're trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, essentially they're trying to get people to register for this conference and get some traction, I think, in, in terms of getting this, this thing off the ground. I think if it does work, if this is successful, I think that would be a good uh, thing for other clubs to follow. So if this was successful, you know, we might, for example, want to follow the same, the same thing. So other clubs in other areas. So I think, um, I think it's good. The local regional representative for the RSGB has also got involved. He seems to be supporting it. So um, all, all, all in all, I think this is quite interesting. We'll have to keep a close eye on um, on how things go. Yeah, well, I wish them every success. And I think that the hub situation will be bigger than clubs and we'll be able to do a lot of other things as well as amateur radio within the same environment. Frank. What's your thoughts on this one? Martin, there are times that uh, people put on forums or uh, give talks and things, and they have their best ideas out there. And sometimes when that's over, they kind of go on their merry way, and, and not much is heard from that. But I think the RSGB forum that you and Chris participated in, and I believe you led and we featured here, is one that has had an impact that's uh, perhaps too soon to call it a movement, but perhaps Richard's uh, conference that he's planning will kick it off into a movement. It's the notion of regionalization. We participate in clubs as individuals, but if you'll go back to your biology class, there was something called an amoeba that an amoeba that the teacher talked about, and and he or she talked about the characteristics of amoebas, and probably had a test question or two on that. Well, we need to think about clubs as groups. And they're a little bit like amoebas. Groups have properties that are kind of different than individuals. So this uh, hub is the concept of regionalization in groups. Can some of these amoeba or amoebae join together and participate as one entity? Clubs have vested interests. I know here in the States, one of the status symbols that clubs have is do we have our own repeater? You know, everybody, every club is going to have their own repeater. And yet very few are talking on their repeaters. And sometimes it's those individual interests of, of competing in a given neighborhood or community that uh, is more difficult than the technology. But I'm sure as M0SGL will tell us a bit on the technology, I suspect that it will be leadership that gets people to think together about the mutual benefit that they will get no matter who takes the lead in organizing the hub and that sort of thing. And I think this is something that absolutely must happen if clubs are to thrive in the future. Yeah, I understand you. Now, mine, you were right. actually in the room when we did this uh, presentation. You were on the produ production crew that day. So I was the front of house engineer for that, uh, helping out the Camham guys, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it, it, you... 
you were there. You saw what was going on. And, I, and I've mentioned a few times that the video shows a few people uh, initially saying that they didn't agree with the thing, which is fine yeah. because that's what a discussion's about. You have a discussion. But there were a lot of people in the room that, unfortunately, the camera didn't pick up on were agreeing, weren't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was it was crazy, the response. I mean, there was obviously quite a long discussion between yourselves and uh, some of the the guests at the RSGB and what have you but the interest you know there were there was definitely there was there were people that were absolutely for this there were people that were dead set against it there was a lot of stuff that 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 didn't make it to air if you like that people had to say and even afterwards people were still coming over across to have their say but of course at that point we'd stopped recording um because we were limited in the time that we could have done but we could have quite easily run (laughs) <laughs> if we'd have let people, we could have run for three or four hours with that, the, the conversations were that much. So, you know, for you know, for this talk to be continuing on, we've, we've obviously sparked some interest there. And they're talking about this, doing this down in what in Somerset, you know, this is, you know, there's clearly there's an interest for it. So let's, let's see where it goes. You know, anything that promotes radio clubs, whether they're a club or hub or whatever, you know, more activity, you know, more things for people to get involved with. Another thing to, uh, Bring joy to amateur radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, in fairness, I thoroughly enjoyed doing the, our, our session at the RSGB because it was interaction. You know, <laughs> it wasn't somebody standing at the front doing a PowerPoint slide pr- presentation. It was interaction. Oh, no, we were out in the audience with microphones. Yeah, yeah. And we we had interaction with people. And people had their say, and we were looking forward to that. That was good. That was good. Mm. Ed, what's your thoughts? Well, I'll echo a little bit what everybody else has said, but it's it's great that uh, Richard for JJP G four JJP uh, is actually starting to implement this as a um, well trying to organise to implement it, and uh, it sounds like it's going to be a good test case and perhaps a model for the future for other clubs to copy, as was also said. So I'm just uh, echoing what everybody else says. It's going forwards. Good on, uh, good on Richard for doing this, and uh, let's wish him all success and uh, see what the next step is. Yeah, yeah, good one on that one, Ed. And uh, you say, I hope Richard, you know, pulls this one off. I really do. Moving on to our next news story: uh, new syllabus exam pass rate figures released uh, in the UK. Now, this is the RSGB's numbers. Uh, Martin, you're uh, one of our examiners. What's your thoughts on this? Um, it's a surprise. When I'm looking at the physical figures. Foundation, 429 candidates, 90 failed, 79% pass rate, 58% pass rate for the intermediate, and 55% pass rate um, for the full exam. And, okay, the full exam, I kind of expected that because the full exam, there's a lot to it. It's very, very in-depth. But Foundation, I'm quite surprised. That's quite a high failure rate for the foundation. The foundation, I, I get that not everyone's going to pass it, but if you'd have asked me to put a number on it, I'd have said, I don't know, probably 90% pass rate, 93, 94 maybe. Um, I'm surprised at 79. So what's going on here? Is this you know, just because people, you know, people coming in are struggling to get the material, understand it? Is that to do with the way people are learning it, the, you know, the way they are being taught? Is that is that the fault of, the the clubs or the trainers or whoever is training this um or is there another factor that we need to consider i don't know well i wonder whether sometimes um maybe we get failures because usually you can tell if somebody's going to fail in your class they're not interested and they've usually been dragged along by another family member so it may be along something along those lines yeah i guess so yeah, but I don't know. But I, I, I was quite surprised that 79%, I'd be devastated for a foundation level if we were only getting 79%, wouldn't I, Chris? I think you would. I mean, we do get the odd failure. Like you say, we get the odd one, but I wouldn't say it's as high as, or as low as, you know what I mean? If we get that many, it would knock it down at 79%. We, I mean, to be fair, we've only done one um, course since they introduced a new syllabus for the foundation. And I think we had four candidates and all four passed. So, so far, we're 100%. Now, okay, we did the next course and, one, you know, we might get one person fell out of four, which would then take us down to 75 on that course, which would still put us above the 79 
you know, stated here. So the, the only thing I think is something that um, Ed mentioned before we started to record. This does include people that don't turn up for the for the for the course or the exam. We we have had that in the past, and that might be the reason why this is a little bit lower. It might be people that uh, for some for reason or another can't actually turn up. You know, book book the exam or the course. Um, you know, months before it's supposed to happen, then for some reason can't make it. So that it could be that it's just people that physically can't turn up or for whatever reason. Essentially, isn't that just fake statistics then? I mean, shouldn't they be discounted it, they, from this? And I, I, this I, I, is I would, just making us look so. bad. It would be it would be better if they published the exam results where no shows were not counted because that's not really showing a true representation, is it? Yeah, is I, th- I believe this uh, release of information is is because it's uh, the exams that are taken on the new syllabus. Where's the statistics from the old syllabus so we can see what's changed? Surely that's what we should be looking at to see. You know, they've probably made the intermediate, I think the intention was to make the intermediate more difficult. So I'd expect the pass rate on that to go down compared to the old syllabus, for example. But if they only give us the new, the new numbers well, and not well, the old numbers, how would you work partic- out what's happened? Yeah, in these particular minutes, they're only showing the pass rates since September, since they've started running the new since syllabus. Since the new syllabus, however, yeah. However, that's just the minutes from his meeting. I have no doubt we could look up the pass rates from, from previous minutes. I, I pulled them up, I think, from the previous, the 2018 report on the Standards Committee. And they have them from 2013 to 2017. And let me just give you 2017 numbers. A foundation, 81.5%. Intermediate, 91.6%. Advanced, 64.9%. For 2017, and and they they go they fluctuate back to 2013. But, but of course, just thinking so about this, of course, we talk about percentages. But of course, this is it is depending on how many you have to look at it properly. Is how many candidates you get? 429 candidates for the foundation with 79 percent pass rate. Intermediate 73 candidates with a 58 percent pass rate, and the full only had 80 candidates with a 55 percent pass rate. So you know you you, you haven't re- you know, percentages. <laughs> You have to be yeah. read in the right way. Uh, and and, it, and to or, be fair, the notes in the minutes do say that a more accurate picture will emerge after more exams have been taken. So this is only yeah. a fairly early days, let's be honest. It's so, only, so the number, yeah. just to go with the percentages, Martin, is uh, for foundation is 1,310, intermediate 592, and advanced 250 yeah. for the 2017 percentage. But it, and it sort of looks as, as though, from the numbers you read out there, Frank, that all three are, have got slightly lower. Certainly the foundation is slightly lower. The intermediate yeah. is significantly lower and the full is lower as well. And that's kind of, certainly for the intermediate, in the, uh, the intermediate, that's expected because they have brought some of the more difficult material from the yeah. full exam into the intermediate to balance things out. So there is an expectation that, that, that the pass rate would reduce for intermediate. I forgot what you said was the full, the previous full, um, or advanced, um, Exam rate, Frank, just remind me from the 2017 what that was? Uh, 64.9, say 65%. Okay, so it's now 55, so that's gone down slightly, but I think it said the intermediate is pretty high. What was that again? The intermediate was, uh, 91.6, 92%. Yeah, just yeah so that's gone from 92% to 58%, so that's a dramatic drop, and that's, I guess that's what was expected, really. Now, of course, as it says in the notes, this is this is still early days. They haven't had that many candidates through the new exams yet, so there'll be a bit of time for us that that to kind of uh, uh, become more accurate, I suppose, once they've got more can more you know more, more bigger sample um, to, to look at. But but the trend is what they were aiming for. I I, I think so. Yes, based on what the discussion we had with the RSB before the new syllabus uh, came into effect and the reasons yeah. for the, the changes. Yeah, well, you know, Chris, that I'm, and the other guys will find out now, I'm in the process of rewriting our intermediate slides. And I, I think we're going to need another day. I think if we try to cram the new, the extra bits into the new syllabus in the same time scale as we actually used to do it, that would be wrong. But I, I think I'm, I'm still of the opinion that we need to give people sufficient time to 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 get this knowledge in their head. You know, if if you're, I know people are able to do a foundation license in a day, uh, but we try and give comprehension, not just this is the fact, regurgitate the fact. We try and give comprehension to yeah. the thing, so that if a, a question comes up that we maybe 
wasn't exactly as they was in the book, at least the people can work it out for themselves and they can debate. As I say, I mean, we were pretty much in the 90% for both foundation and intermediate all the time, Chris, would be my belief. But I mean, so, I, yeah, I, 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 I agree I with what so. you're saying there, Martin. You need, people need to go away and absorb stuff. I sat through, today alone, I've sat through a seven-hour training course online with people talking about stuff, and whereas I absorbed some of it, I probably only absorbed about 20% of it. I've got another one exactly the same tomorrow and on Friday. You're right, people do need to go away and absorb it rather than cram it into a short amount of time. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that that is, that is the key, is not rushing it. Maybe, you know, I'd rather give... Our foundation courses, including the exam, take three days. There you go. So, so my feeling is I give three days for a, a foundation course, where Chris and I do. Now, my feeling is I'd rather do three days training and get a 100% pass mark than to do one day's training and get 50% or, or, or 60%. Because Agreed. Yeah, my, my time, I don't want to waste my time. I, I, if somebody really wants to, to pass the amateur radio exam, then... I need to put that effort in for them to pass, you know. So I, I think that maybe, maybe the the numbers are a little bit lower because people are not giving the time to the students. Uh, and I think, Martin, we've been discussing for the foundation. We do that over, I think, six days. Sorry, the intermediate, sorry, over six days. And I think we need to consider whether that needs to grow, given that the the material and the intermediate has changed whether that needs to become seven days or maybe even longer to make sure we, we have sufficient time to cover all the material that's, that's in the new, you know, the new revised syllabus. So I know you're still working through the material, so we need to maybe perhaps get a view on, on that as we go forward. Yeah, my feeling at the moment is seven days plus a morning for revision and, and the exam in the afternoon, so it'll be about eight days. But yeah. there you go. go so I was going to say, just out of interest, this is actually quite, I find this is actually quite an interesting set of minutes from the RSGB. The meeting from the first of February. There are some other things in there that I won't go into now, but there are some other things in there that I think are a little bit con- uh, contentious. Things like whether they should be a single step to the full license, whether we should publish publish the question banks like the in the state, that sort of thing. So there is some interesting things in there. Those that are involved in training, it's worthwhile having a look at that uh, those, those minutes because uh, there are some things in there. It does show that they are at least considering some things that are quite radical. Yeah, and in fairness, and as Chris and Martin and I know that the RSGB are doing a lot of things and they're moving forward and they're far more progressive than they were years ago. So uh, there's lots of good things happening there, but uh, we'll keep you abreast of what's going on. Moving on to our next news story, copyright infringements between uh, Motorola and wins their case against Hytera. Frank, do you want to go first on this one? Sure. You know, Motorola in the radio world is a bit like IBM used to be in the mainframe computer world. They were the 800-pound gorilla, so to speak. And Motorola has really, really made a splash in the land mobile radio. In fact, they uh, they do a lot of municipal uh, radio systems and, and things like that. As DMR kind of raised its head and Ham's began to take Motorola equipment and uh, retune it to optimize it for ham bands and things like that, leveraging, frankly, the frequency allocation, which put land mobile radio close to ham frequencies and that sort of thing. Uh, that began to become useful. Some other companies, Hytera being one of them in uh, Shenzhen, China, came out with a line of equipment. And this is less about amateur radio, in my opinion, uh, and more about trade secrets and copyright infringement, trade secrets in the design of the radios for digital mobile radio, and copyright infringement due to the software and the programming and the firmware instruction set that are, that are in that. And so Motorola went to court in 2017 in federal court, and they claimed that DMR wasn't playing fair and began to use techniques and things that infringed their patents and trade secrets. Now, the extent to which former employees of Motorola may have gone to work for uh, Hytera and things like that, I'm, I'm less uh, familiar with. Some of the other presenters may know more a bit about that. But 
the story talks about three former engineers who went to work for Hytera. That's not unusual for engineers to job hop, but there are usually legal restrictions on the intellectual property they can take with them. You worked for IBM. There was a big sign in Armonk, uh, New York that said, think. Big sign when you came in the lobby. You know, six feet tall letters. But you were thinking on IBM's nickel. And many corporations that you may have thunk it up, but it's not your idea from a legal point of view. And I suspect that when they left, uh, they had some restrictions placed upon them. And it's not anything unique to amateur radio. You you get it in the refrigeration business, for example. One one uh, freezer engineer goes to work with another company, and suddenly they come out with a freezer, and the first company says, no, that was our design. So it is a victory for Motorola. Uh, Hytera has had, uh, they've been under a, a cloud. I think it may have hurt some of their sales because people didn't want to buy something that they would have to quit using. But the ARL story sort of articulates this. And I'll kind of end there. It's, I don't think the story's over. There's, I suspect there are countersuits by Hatera. And we'll just see this U.S. China conflict is what it amounts to in terms of trade secrets and where it goes from here. I will say Motorola has been sued by many of, of uh, state and local government for not fulfilling their contracts. So these things do happen. Yeah. I get you, Frank. Now, Martin. You are a proud owner of both of Motorola and a Hytera, um, with a big smile on your face. They're both quality radios, in fairness. And um, when I was um, a mobile PMR engineer fixing them, they're both credible, good, good quality <laughs> stuff, aren't they? Absolutely, great products. They're well built. They're obviously designed for uh, the likes of the construction industry, that sort of stuff. Absolutely, and I'd say I will name them both Motorola and Hytera, absolute pain in the neck to program. Maybe not so for the PMR industry, but for the DMR networks and stuff that we use on the amateur radio, they're a pain in the neck. But from the point of view, when they're working, yeah, they work great, they're really well made, and they just do the job. And, you know, you, these the old joke, you can hammer in a nail with a, a GP360 or whatever. It's the same thing with the, the DMR radios. You know, I have to think, you know, with these guys, what happened? Did they not have a period of time where they couldn't work for a competitor? In my job now, confidentiality agreements. I have that kind of thing in my contract. Did, you know, did Motorola miss this? But the one thing that springs to mind over anything else, this sounds very, very familiar to the ongoing saga of those two smartphone companies. And we all know who they are. Keep paying their fines when they get fined by each other in pennies. Yeah, well, you can say that again. But, no, it's, it's interesting stuff. And, uh, yeah, you say about being a DMR being a pain in the neck to program. I remember printing out a configuration file that I'd produced for a customer on a high tier. And I think it went to 27 pages of A4. Uh, and, and the problem is with DMR is you get one tick box wrong and it don't work. And uh, that's what you're finding as a pain, Martin, I know. And... Oh, if I, in fairness, though, I mean, I've come from a D-style background that is relatively easily. I've gone on to Fusion. I still have D-style. I've gone on to Fusion. Fusion is the easiest digital thing in the world Absolutely. to use. Just put a paper on the air yesterday. I agree. Exactly. And you can do it from the front panel. You don't even really have to know what you're doing. DMR, you've pretty much got to be a Motorola or a high tira, um dealer to understand how to get the thing in there in the first place. It's all really well, like, hey, I've bought this radio. It comes with a co-plug, yeah, and then the network changes its thing, um, its talk groups. You know, you, you're in the wrong place, and suddenly, like, what am I doing? So, you know, that's my that's my grief with these things. But, of course, they are these, these radios are designed to be programmed once and installed in your company's network where you have a repeater in your building or whatever. You know, we are taking them out of that. We're putting it in something that was never designed to do. And there's credit for doing that, but there are, you know, there's pros for doing that, but there's also cons for doing that as well. Yeah. Well, in fairness, before I bring the others in, I have programmed Motorola's. I have programmed Itera, DMR, and I've also programmed uh, a Vertex radio, I believe, or a couple of Vertex radios that were DMR. Every one of them is programmed slightly different. And I can only really comment, and I think 
that you and Chris and I, Martin, can only really comment on the Motorola and Hytera. I have not had my grubby hands on one of the uh, radios that's a budget price DMR that's uh, right. being offered. And I don't know if they're any easier to program well. There are videos online of people doing it, and I, I think they're pretty much the same sort of thing because you've still got to do all the different talk groups and things like that. And I, I think they're just... That there's, from what I've seen, they're sort of similar copies to like the Motorola software. Yeah, well, you know, the last time I wrote the Motorola software, I rewrote the code plug for us. I think it took me nearly three months to get a good one. <laughs> they changed it since then. And they changed it. Yelled yeah. out the other day for being on the wrong chalk group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Ed, what's your thoughts on this one? Okay, uh, just coming back on the last couple of points there. Programming the the cheaper. You know, the $100 or sub-$100 DMR HTs that amateurs uh, have bought. Um, I've documented that. I spent probably six months going through that. So if any of the listeners are interested, go have a look on my uh, website, dd5lp.com, um, under equipment and DMR, and uh, you'll see all the steps there, and also there's a lot of history background. Yeah, paint to program program I've heard about and want to try, it's been around a while, whereas normally you get a separate program for each model of each manufacturer, there's a thing called Edit CP, which um, now will um, you can use to modify existing code plugs across multiple radios. Not all, but uh, quite a range. And I am assured that that's a lot easier to use than the uh, the standard code that comes with the, uh, with the, the, the cheap radios. The other thing is this um, article, by the way, uh, in case there's anybody new listening to the podcast, the things we're going through on the news round table are all in the show notes. So uh, it's probably worth opening that because then you can see what we're commenting on. Um, and that's all up, of course, on icqpodcast.com. This, art, this, this thing we're discussing now, I agree with Frank, is more about intellectual property and protecting intellectual property rather than it being amateur radio per se. Yes, it affects some of the manufacturers, but uh, I'm wondering why the ARRL are making comments about it, quite honestly. Um, you know, it's an interesting point. Um, intellectual property is probably better discussed by on intellectual property podcasts or on TV shows that cover that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. There is, there is a radio part to this, but... You know, it's it's not going to affect amateur radio tomorrow. Um, if either Motorola, uh, if Motorola wins some more of their things against high tier and high tier can't sell in the US anymore, yes, you can't buy the high tier HTs. The majority of amateur radio enthusiasts can't afford. The, well, they can afford, but they won't buy those. They'll buy the cheaper ones, in my opinion. So I'll I'll stand back and let people shoot me down on that. No, no so, problem. I mean, the one that I was surprised about when I read the story was that the amount of damages that have been awarded, it's $764 million. That's three quarters of a billion dollars that have been awarded to Motorola by, you know, by the court from Hytera, which to me seems like a phenomenal amount of money. That must be a significant a figure for Hytera to come up with to, 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 to pay that. And um, very uneven, given the two companies. That would not be nearly as big a struggle for Motorola than it would be yeah, for Hytera, but just absolutely. give you a reference point. But that is a significant amount of money. That's not a trivial amount of money. That is probably all the money they ever made out of DMR and probably some more extra, I'd imagine. Um, but I don't know what the turnover is, et cetera. But that seems like a big number to me. Um, and this is kind of similar a little bit. In the UK, we currently have um, a debate around who are we? That's how he said that. That's how he pronounced the name. Right. Huawei. They, however, correct. Possibly. So they they are. There's currently a debate in the government. So they've been awarded a part of the contract to deliver 5G in the UK, and there's been a lot of pressure, political pressure from some of our overseas allies around whether we should be using a Chinese company, which is to some degree seen as almost being part of the the, the government over there potentially. Um, to be involved in such a critical piece of our infrastructure. So there seems to be a potentially political slant, certainly to that story, and maybe, I don't know if that is a similar, you know, it's a Chinese versus an American company here in the American court. I don't, I don't know whether there's any anything there, or is this just a completely impartial case? But certainly it's a significant amount of money which would severely impact 
I mean, I don't know whether it will take criteria out of business. I don't quite know. I presume they're going to appeal this because that's the amount of money that I can't see why they wouldn't. I mean, it's pretty normal for technology companies to, to sue each other. Apple constantly sue Samsung, Samsung sue Apple, and and all the other companies, especially in the smartphone market. So this is fairly typical um, to be suing for uh, trade trademark and so not trademark, so copyright and uh, infringement cases, so and patent cases. So. Um, it would be interesting to see, but certainly that, in my opinion, the comment is it just seems like a phenomenal amount of, of damages that have been awarded. Yeah, well, there's two things on that is, A, will high tier of pay or just say go away? But secondly, if uh, Motorola have issued the writ against high tier, what's to stop them writing out a writ against all the other cheaper manufacturers that uh, get used for amateur radio? Maybe suddenly... I'm, um, I'm kind of guessing that Hyteria is probably the biggest yeah. of their competitors, I'm guessing, yeah. so the, the, the other ones are likely to be, I guess, the, smaller. The, smaller, smaller yeah, the, the, other thing, the other thing, of course, is that Hyteria have a base in the US. The majority of the other cheaper ones don't, and therefore yeah, you'd have to take them to court in China. Uh, good luck with that. Do you know, I was just thinking that, you know, you're sort of really well going against, you know, you know, the American company going against the Chinese company, but you, if, you know, they say, yes, you will pay, but if the company's only based in China... Can you force them to? But if, of course, if they've got an American base, then yeah, perhaps. Well, and yeah. also if their market is is um, a lot of their sales are in the US, then that yeah, I guess the US could could apply. You know, could, I think you do something about that. I suppose they'd say, "Well, you're not selling your, you know, we're not going to take away any kind of import license or whatever, you know, into, into, into the US or something." Like that. I don't know, but yeah, I'm sure there is action that can be taken. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next news story because I think this one will run, that one will run and run. The RSGB examination papers, um, Chris, we are, once again, this is a training thing, and we didn't know about this, and they were supposed to have written to all the exam secretaries. You're an exam secretary. You didn't get this information. And no. it's just making things difficult for the sake of being difficult, I think, this particular thing that the RSGB are putting in place. What do you think? I mean, where do I start with this one? So... This is something that I spotted previously in the so the groups that I owe website for the RGB tutors, which I subscribe to. There was a, 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 a discussion on there around um, that some exam secretaries had noticed, or some exam inners, should I say, have noticed that. So for the foundation exam, just to explain how this works in the UK, if you're an examiner. So each candidate gets the same exam paper, so they're answering the same questions. And up until fairly recently, the order of the answers, so it's a multiple choice paper. You get to choose uh, one of four answers for each question, and you all get identical papers, and all the answers are in the same order. So when it came to marking the exams, that was not too difficult. So, you, you know, every person's question one, the right answer was, say, B. Question two, the answer was C. Question three, the answer was A, or whatever. Now, for some, now bear in mind that the RSGB, the way that the UK exams are held are quite strict. We have to, there's lots of guidelines, you have to draw a plan of the room. Martin Ruffell is one of our examiners for the club that I remember of, so he can perhaps comment as well. But it's pretty strict. You have to have people a certain distance apart, so you can't physically, you know, it's all about stopping cheating. Now, what's happened recently is the RSGB have decided in their wisdom to rather than give everyone the same exam paper, or the, well, they, they've still got the same questions, but they decided to change the order of the answers. So each person's answers are randomly ordered. So if one person's correct answer is, is answer A, well, the next person, the person's actually might be answer D, but they change the order of the answers around. Now that, I suppose, potentially makes it more difficult to cheat. I think it's pretty hard to cheat anyway, frankly, if we're doing the exams properly. Um, what it makes is that actually then at the end of the exam, what happens is typically clubs like to give and are encouraged to give an indicative result to the candidate. So we can say you have passed and your score was 19 out of 26 or whatever the answer, you know, whatever it was. And we can give them a, a view on whether they passed or failed, which is a nice thing to have straight away after the exam. What they're making now, what, they have, what they're essentially doing is making it very difficult, making it more difficult for the clubs to do that because they're now going to have to breach each candidate they have a separate answer sheet, a separate correct answer sheet to compare it against. It makes it more, more difficult. When you have to mark 15 exam papers, which potentially we do in, in our club, it's going to extend the time it takes to do that. Now, bearing in mind that clubs, people that run these exams are volunteers, their time is something they're giving up for free. 
why the exact why the RFP making it more difficult? I don't think there is a problem right now with cheating. Why the exam? Why the RFP decided to make this more difficult for examiners and therefore less likely to want to put exams on? Frankly, um, this is I find frankly a bit annoying, and I think it's frankly pointless. So, I think the real reason why the RFP decided to do this is because they now have online exams and they're trying to encourage clubs to go down the online exam route. So they're making it more difficult for clubs to now run the, the paper exam uh, system. So that's 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 my, my thoughts on this. I think they're just trying to make it hard for people. They want to do it the old way. Now, as a club, we still use the old paper way. I would have potentially liked to look at the online exams. I don't believe... What I would like the RFB to do is to provide a, um, a way of running a, a, an exam as a test. So rather than, as in not a real exam... But we're able to say, okay, here's a demo version of the exam software. Put it onto your laptop, run it in your as a test, you know, as a as a trial. Uh, so not a real exam, but a not a real exam paper, just some dummy questions which don't really matter, just as a test to try and trial the the, the software. Does this work on the internet connection we've got in this room? Whether that would be uh, a land, you know, a fixed ADSL connection or some sort of broadband connection, or whether that's someone's mobile phone working from a cell, you know, over, over the um, cell set, cell network, um, whatever, I would like the, I would like them to do is, so we, you know, if, if we could do that, if we could say, let's, let's take a laptop to our exam room uh, and we'll, we'll load up a, a trial uh, exam using that software. Can we, can we do a, a dummy run? Yeah, that works fine. Tick, brilliant. We've now done with the software. Now it works. And we can now do that for a real exam. But I think the way it works today is that we have to do it the first time for real. And that's not a risk I want to take with, with students that want to take their exams. So for now, as a club, we're running paper-based exams. And uh, it just seems like the RSGP, I, I'm just not really like the approach to taking Frank at the moment around this. So that's me and my hobby horse. Martin, back to you. <laughs> Yeah, well, you were quite clear on your hobby horse, and I knew you, it was something that you were very passionate about, Chris, and I agree with most of what you said now, there. If I've got any of that wrong, then I'm very happy to say I'm wrong, and I'm very happy for the RSGB to come on and, 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 and give a response. That's that I believe what I've, what I've explained there is, is the way that it's um, the way that it works. Yeah, and we're not RSGB bashers, uh, so, you know, this is something we feel strongly about. I'm going to bring Ed in next. Ed. Uh, what's your thoughts on this? Because you were saying that it sounded a bit antiquated the way the exams get done. Yeah, you're talking about people filling in little boxes and then putting a scale over it and all the rest of it. And I'm going, that's something from 40 years ago. What what's what's going on here? Haven't you? You know, haven't the RSGB and other people come up with something better than that? I can understand uh, Chris's, uh, well, let's say, anger that he first of all he and probably multiple other. Uh, exam secretaries were not involved in this decision, although they're expected to do the work. Now, come on, RSGB. You know, uh, you've got volunteers helping you out with all this. The first thing you do is you discuss something before you change it. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, maybe Chris, as Chris says, maybe he's misunderstood anything. Every, uh, sorry, maybe he's misunderstood something to do with this. But uh, uh, I can, I can see definitely where he's coming from. And uh, yeah, I'm. I'm very much in favour of online exams. I think it's the way to go for the future, but not if you rule out uh, paper exams, which seems to be something that's almost happening via the back door in, in making it simply more difficult. I guess the other option the clubs would have is simply they will not give uh, an indicative result. So the uh, people who have sat the exams with the paper exam have to wait maybe one or two weeks before... Uh, before they'll get the official answer, uh, whether they've passed or not, which is uh, a retrograde, a retrograde step. And the other Martin, I think, is uh, able to give some comments as being the experienced examiner, which I am not. I'm just so, stood on the sidelines. So, so just one thing on that, so before Martin jumps in. So, Ed, you mentioned about this. So I know that the US exams, they work where they have a, a kind of a, an acetate film that they put over the exam, uh, the exam um, papers. In the UK, that isn't the way it works. The, the, examiner, the examiners have to check each answer individually rather than be able to put the film over top to identify the correct or wrong answers. But um, just, I just wanted to make it clear, that's all. Okay, that, that's even worse. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Right, I agree. Mr. Rothwell, over to you. Hello. 
Um, yeah, so the interesting comment, this ensures that there is no relative advantage or disadvantage between online and paper exams. First question, why are they different in the first place? Who programmed that? Now, I, now, I think I'm with you on this, Chris. I completely disagree with this decision. Online, doesn't matter what order they're in. It's all marked electronically regardless. But on paper, I don't think this has been thought through. And don't get me wrong, I completely support the RSGB in almost everything they do. This, though, I disagree. If people are cheating and they're worried that people are cheating, then the exam sensors aren't set up correctly, and they need to address that with the people that are running those exam sensors. The only thing that this is going to achieve is it will delay people getting um, an indicative mark. And when I, when I first did my foundation, I couldn't wait to know whether or not I'd passed. I don't want to wait for you know two weeks while someone goes away and marks it. It will annoy the volunteer, say so stress volunteer examiners who are marking these papers, and it's going to, and it's always going to result in people, you know, these volunteers just saying to themselves, "Do you know what? It's too much effort. I really can't be bothered with this. Let's just not bother with the training." The only thing this will succeed in doing is it will make make it harder for people to get into the hobby, which of course is against the whole principle of the RSGB. Throw any babies out without bath water? I'm sorry, I don't think this has been thought through. Reading between the lines, they want people to go to the online exams, but in our case, our internet connection that we have in our in our hall comes from a local church. It's got um, an Ethernet cable that runs out under the bushes that foxes often chew through. It's not particularly fast. You know, we don't necessarily have the ability to be able to run that. So, you know. <sighs> I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. And like Chris, you know, if, if if we've got it wrong and the RSGB wants to come and, you know, give us a statement to do this, please, we'll give you the platform. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Martin. I said, Frank, although it's uh, not your side of the pond, um, I've done your exams and you guys do have different, different question papers. You can give us a bit more of uh, on that, but... But you are marked there and then on the spot as well, aren't you? There are. And I want to just say I'm delighted that M0 SGL is thinking about how to give babies a washing because he's got one that's going to be <laughs> arriving soon. Yeah. So I'm glad to see these guys' priorities straight. But uh, in a more serious vein, yes, they tend to be marked. And as Chris said, there's a little template that, that's over the paper and you can kind of quickly go through and mark the ones that they didn't mark if that was the right one and they missed it. So typically, and I know this varies over here by the VE team. So styles vary. Most of what I've seen and familiar with is they'll tell you, Hey, Frank, you passed. Great job. He's, Oh, did I miss any? Oh, you missed two or you missed three or Frank, you didn't pass. And, but it was close. You know, you only fail by one. That's the kind of feedback, and it's usually at the end of the exam period, sometimes during the exam period itself if you're an early finisher. So that's the general style. But they don't give you your test paper back to see which ones you missed. And um, I've seen some person emulate uh, sucking lemons when he was asked to see the paper. So that's generally a norm that they generally don't do. Cheating. Uh, we typically have five different forms. And if you've got, say, a dozen or more different forms are given out to people sitting next to one another. So there's that bit of you can't kind of look over someone else's shoulder to see what number three's answer is from their exam. So that's typically the, the way it's done here. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it's a different environment, but... Uh... And I understand why you do it that way, because Chris and I were sitting right next to each other, and the uh, examiner said, make sure you put the examiner, examination uh, question paper number on the top of your form. And I went, where's that? And Chris said, it's 222. And he looked across and pointed to mine, and it wasn't 222. So that's how we knew we were doing two completely different papers. When I did the American exams, it was far more laid back. There were people... It wasn't a quiet room. It wasn't it, like I would sit, say, a proper exam environment. Whereas what what we've been requested to do by the RSGB is do a proper exam 
environment where we, people are separated by so much and you know you go around you take mobile phones off them and books and you check that they haven't got a, a programmable calculator and all these sort of things so um i don't as i think it was either martin or chris said if somebody is cheating if if the belief is that there's cheating going on then they should go and look at the the exam centers that are cheating uh in fairness anyway i think that one will run and run uh frank you put up the next news story and i think it was very valid um attracting youth to ham radio get out of their way so over to you frank uh thanks martin i put in the show notes that oh no the podcast has finally run out of good stories mon dieu so uh we'll, we'll go from there this was an op-ed piece to follow up the feature interview that I did with Graham Brody that appeared in the last episode, uh, 319 for the ICQ podcast. Graham Brody is a 15 year old, uh, young person in Illinois, just Northwest of Chicago. And he started the Illinois young ham radio club. He's a member of the North shore amateur radio club. That's there. I think Deerfield is the name of the, the town and they helped him get started. But, there's a couple of things in my op-ed piece I wanted to point out, and people can hopefully listen to the previous episode and hear Graham speak for himself. And if they choose to read my um, blog at k4fmh.com, but here's the main come up. Uh, we suffer uh, worldwide. If you eat a lot of meat from uh, problems with our hearts and our arteries, and we have what's called hardening of the arteries where we have plaque buildup. Well, we also have something as a sociologist like myself might say, we have hardening of the categories. We have a sense of the way things ought to be done. And what I'm hearing Graham tell us is that imagine if we hams, and I call us collectively, if we're over a certain age, you make up whatever that line is in geezerdom. I'm 67, so I certainly fit there. Imagine if we were recruited to go be in a youth club of gamers who play esports, who do a uh, Fortnite and whatever the ones are. I, I don't do that. Um, what, what if we were solicited and there was a national organization that really tried to get us old timers to go pay money to be part of a club driven by people 25 years of age, say, and younger. And, um, they're going to tell us how to do this and try to get us involved. How many of us would do that? Well, it might be fun. But I doubt many of us would do it. So that's what we're really asking young people to do is come to us. And my op-ed piece saying, let's help them get started. Let's try to not lecture them. That was one thing Graham pointed out. Come give us a demo, but don't lecture us. We get enough lectures as it is. Put yourself in the shoes of a young person if you can. Any parent, this means you, Martin Rothwell, it's coming. Any parent who has a child who becomes a teenager knows what the prime oral directive is. Martin will compare notes. Establish your independence. No matter what it is, arguing over eating vegetables, you know, what have you. So. I don't like vegetables, all right? Yeah, that's right. And, and, and you, you need to train that, that new one to like those green peas because you'll catch them on the other end. Believe me. <laughs> Uh, so you think about who the young people are we're trying to recruit. Let's get in their heads as a market and let's help them start clubs. And if they don't want to hang around those geezers, let's help them start a youth club. That's what Graham did on his own. And how did he find out about amateur radio? No, not sitting at the knee of some Elmer. He ran across it on this thing called YouTube. So I think we need to listen to Graham. He's, he's one person, but he's certainly a leader. I suspect that the gaming and hacker spaces are places that we can recruit. Do we go do um, tables and things at uh, hacker conferences and maker conferences? I don't think we do that that much. But that's why the old bank robber in the United States who robbed banks, and they said, why do you rob banks, Willie? He says, well, that's where the money is. Well, that's where these people are. So we need to think about that. And, and I'll, I'll ring off with that, Martin, but that was kind of the opinion. I've had a number of people write me and be very encouraging. The Eastern Pennsylvania section of ARL just published a podcast. It will be in the show notes called What Hams Do. 
And there are a couple of interviews that are just absolutely spot on to support what uh, Graham has said. There's one who says, I don't care to talk to other people. I do care to control a robot, a model airplane, and other things, and I, I want to do that with ham radio. And then there's another one that kind of gets into the hacking part of it. So we need to listen. And we old geezers tend to have hardening of the categories, and we don't want to listen. I think this has been an effective op-ed because, yes, I got hate mail uh, from a ham who was taught by an Elmer back when he was a young feller, and he just didn't think that I ought to be saying all this stuff. And I, I'll leave it at that. I made uh, published a blog post about that one particular mail call, when the Elmer needs Elmering, because it illustrates perfectly why we're not reaching young people. We can't bring them to us. we got to go to them and let them hang among themselves. Yeah, well, Frank, I know that you're young at heart, and I'm only a few months younger than you, and... The pair of us, when we're together, Colin refers to us as the terrible toddlers, doesn't he? Because he can't keep us under control. Uh, but uh, And I was also uh, best man at Martin Rothwell's wedding when him and Emma said, I might be old, but I've never grown up, so I was good enough to be his best man. <laughs> but in the you nicest... Know, come on, Martin, you know that men don't grow up. He's just a toy of getting more expensive. Yeah, yes. yeah. But uh, in fairness, yes, you're right. Just because just because we did it one way years ago doesn't mean we've got to do it the same way. And it, it we're moving on. There's lots of new things in amateur radio. Amateur radio is far bigger, far more interesting than it ever was. So One of the cool things, Martin, is if we let them have their own clubs, they'll eventually grow up and join ours. Correct. How many people have we seen that, have come into the hobby because you no longer have to do Morse. And then they, certainly in the UK, you show a Morse as a Morse appreciation. It's not an exam pass, it's an appreciation of what it is. And they want to do it afterwards because they know, they're not being told you've got to do it. And youngsters included. The youngsters love Morse. It's old fashioned. However, let's not ram it down their throat day one. Let's bring them to the hobby and get them in the hobby and let them see the whole thing. Will be where I come in, I think. Mr. Rothwell. So, oh, oh, Chris. So I was just go jumping, on, Chris. Sorry. So I only got a quick comment. So you talk about, so just uh, when, when we go to Fridgesolve, and I, I noticed when, when we, we've been for the last few years, it, it does co- coincide with the Maker Fair at the same time at the same event. So, and that does seem to attract, that's really my own exposure to, I suppose, that environment and that does seem to attract quite a few young people where they're making doing things with 3d printers they are um making interesting pc cases they're doing all kinds of clever things and uh and i think the idea is to i guess to try to attract people in both directions people from amateur radio perhaps to get more interested in some of the wider technologies that are out there and also to, to try to attract people from um the maker community into, into amateur radio so i think that's um that's interesting. I don't know if we actually manage, I don't know if it works or not. I don't know if we do get many folks, many of the youngsters that from the, the Maker Fair wandering around looking at the amateur radio things, but, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be good if they were. Sorry. Um, yeah. Back to you, Martin. Yeah. Chris, Chris, an update on that. As of last year or, or last year, the Maker Fair wasn't there anymore oh, no. because their back, because their backers went broke. So oh, it was actually a magazine and, and uh, they had financial problems. But when they were there, I would say maybe two or three percent of them would come around the radio side and uh, and ask questions. But maybe not as many as we would like. Um, but uh, as I said, that opportunity. Uh, well, unless unless that maker group has now got more sponsorship from somebody new. Um, as far as I know, there's no plans for them to be there this year. But but there are other you know there are maker spaces that in local communities that tend to be advertised and there are state maker uh, yeah. activities this was a, this was part a, of the stem. This, this yeah. is a national this one, was, sure. No, 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 it wasn't national. It was major regional, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Oh, and what's your thoughts on this one? Well, you, we're talking about attracting youth to ham radio. I mean, I don't have much to say, but of course you should encourage uh, young people into the hobby. Welcome in in any way, shape or form. You know, we always say that the, the youth are the future of the hobby. And I always think of things, when we think of the young people, think of the kids 
um, at the scout event we did a while back, just running around, going berserk, playing with a PMR 446 handhelds. They absolutely loved it. They loved these toys. Uh, we were running a ham station as well, and the ones that were really interested in the radio came in and had a look, and like, hey, what are you doing? What's going on there? And you know, in any way that you can attract younger people into the hobby, the better. You know, the, It's the young people that come up with the new ideas as well, not just the old people that have been in it all their life. So um, let's go for it. Yeah, it is. It is making it interesting, making it fun. And I think a lot of us older hams should show an interest. We are in danger of, uh, for argument's sake, the first time you work in the States or Australia, you're on cloud nine. Yeah? Now, some of the old boys, if if a newbie goes into a club and says, oh, i just work in the States, and uh, but some of the old boys will turn around and go, yeah, got the T-shirt, wrote the thesis, yeah, did it years yep. ago, it's dead easy, blah, 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 blah. Wrong attitude. Let's show some enthusiasm for what people are doing. Even if you've done it yourself, even if it's easy for you, it might not be easy for them. And yeah. when yeah. they've achieved and something, it's the achieving of something that's important, I think. Just just give them a pat on the back, say, you know, oh well done, where'd you work? Who'd you talk to? Show yeah. a bit of interest. I mean, you know, you, I mean you know you know who I'm talking about, but you know, I remember when I first turned up to the club and someone said to me, Oh, what are you interested in? Though I like chat to people i want to you know go on two meetings i want to have a chat with people have a rag chew with people and i just got the look of why you're not the kind of person we want in amateur radio but oh thanks nice to be welcome to the hobby and then someone else pat me on the back and said don't worry about him yeah. <laughs> you know and then they they gave me sort of the response that i was really looking for like welcome come in and i think everyone can do that you know everyone gives people a pat on the back oh yeah yeah uh, and and if if you're looking for enthusiasm from a, a young amateur there's a uh, lady called Raisa who, uh, using YouTube, every month or so is putting another video up about her entry into amateur radio. Ra- uh, so the, if you search for YL-RAISA on YouTube, you get a complete series of so many different parts of amateur radio she's covering um, and with enthusiasm. I mean, enthusiasm is the word. It's, it's actually a pleasure to watch. Uh, somebody new to the hobby actually seeing the almost the magic in the hobby like we saw years ago but this is a younger person she's in her 20s so not a really young person but certainly by our standards young and uh, she actually operates a station in finland which is oh 73 elk but she's actually from russia so it's interesting uh thing to look up there and uh yeah because it's on youtube hopefully a lot of the younger people are uh are seeing that coming back to what what we've said earlier on in this uh, uh this program as well the idea is frank saying that this uh, young gentleman of what was he 15 14 Fif- did you say 15 years old 15 sets up his own club uh with hopefully with some ability to support from another club that's that's hubs and clubs again if you like in in many ways we're coming full circle to what we were talking about earlier on, where you have maybe a you know, a well-established uh, club in an area, but then rather than just trying to do new activities within the club, you actually have mini clubs, you know, which could be youth, it could be specialist satellite, it could be anything that have some sort of association with that club, and each of those clubs attracts their own kind of people or their own age group. Yeah, maybe that's the way we should go forwards, and because uh, you get more flexibility uh, than you know the pre- the president or the the secretary saying you can't do that because we're not going to finance it. Well, if you're running your own club and you're only going back to the central club for you know just for general reporting and communication purposes, um, you've got more freedom in in the in the groups within the groups, so to speak. Yeah, it's an interesting one, Ed. Right, well, we're running very long at the moment, so uh, I'm going to finish up with the uh, uh, the new story of a working scale model of the HF curtain is now uh, in on show at the uh, Voice of America Museum, and 
As long as we can get out there, boys, because we say we're coming this year. Ed, Chris and I are coming over to uh, Dayton this year. We've also planned to go to see this, haven't we, Ed? Yep. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll be doing a tour around the VOA Museum, and that's where this is. And uh, it, it's really neat what they've done. The actual antennas for the uh, relay station, the VOA relay station, um, near Cincinnati. I can't remember the name of the actual location. Westchester? Westchester. Yeah. Uh, the antennas from when that was a high powered station have gone, unfortunately. But, um, they've actually had somebody design and build within the club, within the WC8 VOA club. Um, it's actually Richard Kreuter, WC8RK, and Joe Burke, WA8OGS. They designed and constructed a scaled down version. Uh, so instead of being on the HF band, this one's actually on 70 SEMs, so 430 megahertz. And it's actually a working model. And so I'm just looking forward to seeing this because it's just better than a picture. You've actually got something that's working and uh, uh, you can see technically why it works. And I think it's great that they've done that because, you know, they're they're making more of a hands-on museum in some ways, I guess. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Looking forward to getting over to uh, to the US again. Hopefully uh, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, may have settled down and a bit more under control by that time. But I think, like a lot of people in the world, we're just waiting and see to see what happens. But as Martin said, uh, we're coming if we can. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll uh, meet some uh, listeners there again like we did last year, which was a great thrill. Okay, who's next one on this? Well, I'm going to pass it around to Mr. Ruffo. Unfortunately, you're not coming with us, but I'll try and take a lot of photographs, Martin, so you can see what we're talking about. Okay. I'll be honest with you. I had had loads in the last story we were about to talk about, but not as much on this. My first question was, what, what is an HF curtain? Googling pictures of it, though, it, it almost looks like the Russian woodpecker antenna. Yeah. Um, but I'd be interested to see the 70 Sems version of it and how, how well that works. But uh, So I couldn't find a picture of that anywhere uh, online. Well, it's well, the, Stur- the Sturbuck curtain is one you might Google and see. That was uh, some bloke named Sturba had a design that I think was very popular in the early days. Yeah. Well, you're going to be with us there, Frank, aren't you? I certainly plan to be, and I look forward to this. I, I must say, I was, um, just, just thrilled to see that antenna at, uh, WLW. Cause I, when I got home the next day, I went and looked up this old box that had in a black magic marker, QSL's important underlined, and it was over 50 years old. And I went and looked up my, uh, QSL card, uh, reception acknowledgement from over 50 years ago of WLW. And as you remember, they gave us one as a courtesy today. So seeing this curtain, I'm sure I will get just as big a thrill out of it, besides the fact that it's working, as I did seeing that uh, that beautiful WLW antenna screen. That is the background shot on my desktop PC, uh, the picture I took with my iPhone. So, Yeah, that's a good one. Chris, your thoughts on that? Having a play with this? Yeah, actually, it's very interesting, I guess. I mean, obviously, we went last year to see it, like Frank and, and the other guys and, and Dan, and and um, it was a very interesting thing to go and look at. Uh, this sounds very interesting, actually. This this um, model, um, obviously, we scaled it down to work on 70 centimetres, but um, it's a fully working model. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I guess it's, you know, experimentation and things can be done. It looks like they've used some modelling software to... Uh, Check out its gain, etc. But uh, yeah, it looks quite a, an interesting um, model, and uh, you know, if they can plug it into, into a, a transmitter and and and, um, and study it, I think it's uh, it's a good teaching area as well. I think you know to understand perhaps how that sort of aerial works, etc. So yeah, I think that's uh, we we'll look forward to seeing that when we visit the museum in May. We certainly will. We certainly will. Right, guys. Well, that concludes the news stories. Now I need to find out what you've been up to. But before we do, um, just a quick announcement. We understand that the uh, the 
coronavirus is uh, out there. We understand it is. People are taking precautions. At the moment, us at the ICQ are not panicking. Uh, We're attending rallies wherever we can. We will uh, be out in the States providing that our travel plans can be uh, okay. Um, So uh, I'm certainly attending a rally in Sandwich, the uh, Hamzilla rally, uh, later in the uh, month, in about a couple of weeks' time, with Mrs. B and Edmund. So, uh, you know, I I think you can't shut everything down. Uh, I do feel sorry about people that uh, maybe have lost loved ones, and our condolences go to them. But it is important, I think, that we, we don't panic. What's your feeling, guys? I think my, I think my view is that we should hope for the best and plan, plan for the worst, really. Um, hopefully uh, it won't be as bad as some people think. Um, I think we need to all be sensible and follow the advice that we're given by the health authorities, things like washing your hands, etc., and um, and you know, the, the things that are going to come along maybe later on. But um, I think we should try to continue as we as, as best we can. Um, and yeah, fingers crossed, we can still visit. Um, visit the states. Looking at the internet, there's been quite a few events that have been cancelled um, regarding amateur radio. And I understand why. Uh, I think one of the concerns is that uh, we do have an aging population and a hobby, and, and they're perhaps vulnerable to this. Uh, particular virus but um uh fingers crossed that that dating will still happen you know assuming it's safe for it to do so and that we'll be there and uh meeting our listeners and uh and talking to various people but uh, we'll have to wait and see yeah well remember soap and water and washing your hands properly uh is recommended the uh sanitizer gels are a secondary and Washing your hands, if it's done properly, medically, what the medical way, takes about a minute. So there's quite a bit to it. And I suggest you just look it up on the internet. It might be worth doing uh, and knowing how to do it anyway. Anybody else got any saying on this one? Totally in agreement with you. I'm just glad I know that Chris is going to bring some hand sanitizer with him. He's got, uh, he's, he's got quite a coterie here if you're here on the video thing. But to be to be brutally serious, uh, this is serious, and the mortality rate is a little higher than the seasonal flu, and much of it is we just don't know. I think in some of our communications yesterday and today, uh, some of us said that, that we, we just don't know. So we'll, we have a wait-and-see attitude, and hopefully we'll uh, most of us will be there, and uh, Dayton will, uh, will continue, and, and if not, we'll make other arrangements, but we'll continue on. Certainly will. So be positive, guys, and we hope to meet up with uh, you all in Dayton, um, or those of you are going. Right, uh, let's see what each and every one of you has been up to since the last time. Let's go with Martin first. What have you been up to, Martin? Oh, um, what have I been up to? Bit of D-Star, bit of uh, Fusion. Uh, I went on DMR today and got yelled out for being on the wrong talk group. Um, <laughs> but that happens every way. Every time I come out at uh, Zello, um, I use Zello most mornings. Um, you may remember mentioning me saying that the the Fox is ate through my antenna cables for a, a couple of HF antennas I have out in the garden. Uh, I've been out and repaired them, and I've actually put them inside some old garden hose. So hopefully, unless I have a fox with very very strong teeth, they won't destroy them again. Unfortunately, they did get their own back on me because uh, yesterday morning after I after I'd done the cables of the weekend yesterday morning i found i'd gone outside and they got into our food waste bin which was all over our front drive so well, they got their own back on me also been on hf today uh, as we've been working from home because just got cold and the boss said hey stay home so i did 20 meters absolutely wide open to the states um I hear people talking uh, all over the place all across europe and uh, i did put a few calls out but uh, the one guy i was trying to speak to um somewhere in canada he had a massive pile up and uh, a couple of very, very impatient, uh, power hungry stations. And I, uh, I just gave up in the end, but it was uh, nice to see there was some activity, uh, going out on HF. Other than that, I've been playing with my, uh, my SDR play. I'm doing a bit of decoding with that, uh, getting some, uh, things working. But because I have an audio set up on my home PC for the podcast and other radio stuff that I do, it's a bit difficult using the virtual audio cables to route stuff between 
the SCR Uno app and whatever app it is that I'm trying to decode with. Um, so uh, getting a little bit frustrated, but I think I, I might just put the SDR radio on the, the, the laptop and be done with it. Um, but yeah, that's uh, pretty much uh, what I've been up to in the uh, last uh, month or so. Well, you've been a busy boy. You've been a busy boy. I've been so. trying to. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Ed, what have you been up to since the last time? Well, uh, some of my radio-related work's been defined by the weather. We've had some pretty hefty storms, like in excess of 140 kilometres an hour sometimes, and the antennas got a little bit damaged at one point, the wire antennas, so part of the last four weeks I've spent uh, fixing up the antennas, uh, all working again now for the time being anyway. Um, but I've also been, between the storms, being uh, able to get out and do some summits on the air activation. So I was out uh, at one summit this morning. Um, so I timed that one lovely. Uh, that uh, just packed up before the wind started and just got uh, got back down just in time. But the other thing I've been involved with, which isn't directly amateur radio, however it is related, what's happening around Germany and around Europe and around the world is that slowly but surely, as we know, a lot of shortwave broadcast stations are closing down. But what's happening to those frequencies? Well, in the case in Germany, uh, if you have a group and a reason for uh, wanting to have a frequency, you can apply and you can be issued with a, a shortwave broadcast frequency. Now, Channel 292 has been doing this for like about five years. And a new one's just started up in the north of Germany called shortwaveradio.de. The name of the station is the same as their website. And uh, they actually run a one-hour amateur radio-related program. In other words, uh, stories from amateur radio, uh, all in English. And uh, actually, their target market is the UK and the, the uh, Benelux countries. And they're actually, you won't hear them in the uh, in the States, Frank, because they're actually on 3975 kilohertz, which over here is uh, a broadcast band. In the States, it's the amateur band. Um, and the other place they are is uh, six, 6160 at different times. Um, but it's uh, like three, uh, sorry, it's two or three, I'm not sure now, uh, radio amateurs that own and run this radio, this shortwave broadcast station and uh, slowly but surely we're getting more and more of these around the world. There's WTWW in the US, of course, which is a complete family of radio amateurs that run uh, that shortwave station. Um, but as I said, slowly but surely we're getting um, amateur radio enthusiasts almost extending the hobby into shortwave AM broadcasting, which uh, uh, I'm, I'm helping those guys as in I'm recording some stories for them and, and sourcing things for content. Um, and, yeah, that's pretty well taken quite a bit of my time up over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, sounds great, Ed. Sounds great. And uh, you've been busy and interesting that uh, it's all going on. Frank, what have you been up to since last time I caught up with you? Well, just a couple of ancillary comments. I have the same problem that uh, Martin Rothwell has with uh, connecting SDRs. I've got about four SDRs that... You know, I get lost in the virtual channels, Martin, <laughs> and, and yet I have a mixer on that same machine as part of what I call my receiving station, which also has a unit and scanner. So I probably just made it too darn complicated. But Ed, I used to co-host a show with Ted Randall on WTWW and did that for a couple of years. And Ted and his family do they make their their day money, if you will, with the commercial broadcasting um, stations that they engineer for and maintain. The WTWW is owned by a family that inherited it from a parent. I believe they live in Utah, and it's primarily religious programming that pays the bills. But Ted has certainly, uh, on 5085, uh, you know, had amateur radio front and center. So I'm delighted to hear that you're you're doing some content uh, programming for him there. It's, it's really it's just kind of cool to be on a hundred thousand watt shortwave station. If you're a radio amateur, it's just a different thing. Well, my yeah, time Frank, is Frank. sorry, Frank. Yeah. Just clarify, I'm not doing something for WTWW. I'm doing it for the the little German equivalent. It's only a one kilowatt station. So oh, good. Dot de. Yeah, very good. But but in fact, I may hear it because there are web SDRs like the one in absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I I do try to get around if I can listen to the language. 
I, my time has, has been taken up with two things. One, I finally got a, re, a fusion repeater back on a TV broadcast tower yesterday, and we're sort of testing it and testing to see if the fans on the amp are, are going to going to uh, reduce the heat and stuff. The digital mode, once we link it to another similar repeater on the east side of Jackson and then one in the north side of Jackson on a cell tower, I'm not sure that little amps that we have are going to hold up. We're doing a little bit of that work with the, a person that I partner with. My main focus uh, since the last podcast I've been on has been on preparing a paper that combines the um, Sherwood table Stuff. You know, I interviewed him for the podcast, and he and I have continued to talk about his measurements. But basically, the paper's title is uh, "Does Can Price Buy Rig Performance and Satisfaction? And I've looked up the prices when rigs were entered into the marketplace. Took a good bit of time. And also scraped the EHAM satisfaction scores. So kind of looking at those three. And I'm literally finishing uh, the analysis today, and I'll probably have that paper drafted by next week. So some surprising answers, some not so surprising, but I'm real pleased with the results. So that's that's captured a good bit of my time, Martin. Sounds like it, Frank. Sounds like it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see that. Chris, you and I do a lot together, cause, <laughs> but what have you been up to? Well, if I'm honest, not a huge amount this, the last, since the last episode. I've done a tiny bit of HF the weekend. I've not had a lot of time recently. Um, worked at Station Island on 40 metres on Saturday. Uh, I've also managed to finally put a radio in my car. Um, the particular car I've got now, it's very difficult to actually fit anything in it because it's got a glass roof. It's got a big, quite a large air uh, roof. It's made out of glass. And there's not a lot of, there's not any obvious way of mounting a radio head unit inside the vehicle. Um, what I've, what I have done is a temporary measure. We're now doing a fair bit of driving down to the south coast, uh, on a fairly regular basis is I'm, I've put my FT817 and it's kind of jammed between the passenger seat and the, uh, center console. So it's kind of, it, it's not brilliant, but it gets me on the air. I, I'm, I'm only running five watts, but that seems to be okay. I'm listening out through some repeaters. Uh, not, I've put out a few calls. No one's actually spoken to me yet, but uh, I know it's working. So, um, listen out for me uh, operating mobile over the next uh, next few weeks. But uh, that's, oh yeah, and of course, I've been to Wedgwood's Belfast Mall, as we do on a fairly regular basis. And I think we're going to be there this weekend, although that'll be the day before this goes out, I, I would think. You're yeah, dead right. We will be there the day before this goes out. And, uh, yeah, I'm hoping I will work here because um, one of the repeaters on your trip to the south coast I use going to and from work, and it will get down, right down to the south coast as well. So it's got phenomenal coverage. So uh, yeah. we will hopefully catch up on the repeater as well. well right. Because- yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've done a fair bit, but uh, I'll, I'll shoot through them quickly. Um, I do do a lot of simplex, two meter simplex, and uh, I've spent a fair amount of time on GB3 MH, which is uh, at Turner's Hill, as Edmund tells me, and it is uh, Echo Link connected, so you might catch me on that. I did have an afternoon, I played a bit of HF, had a few contacts, so I was quite pleased with that. I Last Saturday, I needed a bit of therapy, you know, I needed to build something, and one of the guys in the club, Steve, gave me uh, two headphone amplifier kits. Uh, and effectively, there were only 20 components, but I sat down quietly and made the two boards. And I quite enjoyed it. It was just peace and quiet, allowed to get on with it, do do this, and thoroughly enjoyed it. So that was a, a good one. Uh, yeah, you're right, Chris, we're on HMS Belfast uh, this weekend, so uh, that will be good. But uh, unfortunately, when the listeners find out about it, we're back home. I did try um, repairing a old micro fist mic that I got to the rally, and it was well and truly broken. And uh, when I opened it up inside, um, I, it was wired up wrongly. Somebody had obviously wired it up, maybe for a CB, and they didn't know what they were doing. And I eventually got all the wiring working right, only to find that the um, it was a dynamic mic, only to find the 600-ohm coil was all burnt out. So God knows why they put up the voltage up the coil. So the coil was all burnt out. So that went in the bin. And lastly, 
she must be obeyed. And when I say her name, she'll, she'll spell off. Is now um, working quite well with the ICQ podcast. I'm able to get it to uh, play. I I say her name, followed by uh, play podcast ICQ podcast episode three twenty for argument's sake, and it will play the podcast. So um, that's fairly consistent now. Are work. you referring to a certain Amazon device that you connect to the internet, Martin, a speaker-type device? I am which, talking about... we shall mention in case a thousand of our listeners suddenly start yes, to... Um, I, I try to refer to, to it as an Echo. Well, All right. Brand okay. name is an Amazon Echo. All right, okay, an Amazon Echo then. I, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm trying not to say its name because it's, it's not whatever that you, the, the, It's called an Amazon Echo. Just don't start saying the word Alexa because it will wake everyone's machines up. Yeah, but fortunately I'm on headphones, Martin, and my one hasn't heard <laughs> it. <laughs> well, Alexa, did you say it? The word Alexa. Okay. That's, that's the thing, isn't it? Alexa set, a country, set an alarm for country music for 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. I'll get us in a lot of trouble. You Martin, naughty. cut that out, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I bet he doesn't. <laughs> I bet I doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, well, guys, thank, thanks for joining me tonight. We've gone fairly long, and I know there was a, at least one news story I had to cut. I, I, I apologise on that. It probably was the weakest, but uh, I had to cut it because we were running far too long. So I'd like to thank Mr Chris Howard, M0TCH. Uh, thanks for joining us, Chris. Thanks, guys. Another fun, another fun episode. I'd also like to thank Mr Martin Ruffell, M0SGL, who's uh, got Lily sitting on his lap. That, that explain that one. Lily is my cat, for those that don't know. But yeah, she's been here uh, helping all evening. So if you hear any purring, that's why. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP. Very welcome. Till the next one. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it again soon, mate. Don't worry. And last but not least, my partner in crime when I'm in the States, who's going to try and get me into as much problems as possible, is Mr. Frank Howe, K4FMH. Hi, Frank. Glad to be here, guys. And, and for my part, FBI stands for Frank's Bureau of Investigation when it comes to Martin. So I'll, I'll try to keep you keep you on the short list, Martin. That's all but right. I want yeah. to say thanks to, thanks to all of our listeners and thank you for the, the kind remarks that we occasionally get. And we enjoy this partly because we enjoy each other. But we also enjoy interacting with you. So great to be here again, Martin. Yeah, yeah. And you're dead right. I do get a lot of uh, positive feedback, certainly recently when we've been going to rallies about how they do enjoy us all. And it is fun. And and somebody said the other week, you seem to be having too much fun doing these podcasts. Uh, And as Dan said, you can never have too much fun. So we thank our listeners for, for putting up with us, put it that way. So I'd like to say 73 to you all. This is not the end of the podcast, just the end of this section. 73 all. 73. 73. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin m 6 boy we start with news here in the UK. Ofcom has stopped issuing short call signs. Now, uh, since uh, the middle of 2018, uh, those passing the RSGB exam for a full license have been able to apply for short call signs such as M5 and N2 uh, suffixes. This has uh, provided a major incentive upgrade to a full license. However, it now appears this has been reversed. Uh, a statement from Ofcom says an applicant for a new license for a full club license may request a call sign with three training letters using any valid full license prefix in the list above except a G2. Call signs using formally issued prefixes are not available via the licensing portal or must be requested on a paper application form with the applicable fee. A call sign with only two training letters or which starts with G2 is only available if the applicant previously held it. A policy that a station may change its call sign only in exceptional circumstances remains unchanged, although Ofcom may, on occasion, require a station to change its call sign. Uh, so the change in uh, the policy affects the issue of the old amateur radio call signs that had been issued prior to the start of World War II. But it's unclear why M5 uh, XX call signs are also affected. Up until mid-2018, this call block had never been issued before. 
The policy doesn't affect any call signs that have already been issued. So we'll uh, pop a link to the Ofcom announcement on icqpodcast.com and you can check out what that may mean uh, for your potential call sign in the future. So it's now come up to the year anniversary of uh, a couple of transponders that were upon the Qatar Oscar 100 uh, CubeSat. And uh, basically now they're going to be doing a bit of upgrade work and getting some more bandwidth going. So the capacity of the transponder will be expanded from around uh, 250 kilohertz to almost 500 kilohertz. And then in addition, they're also extending the areas of various operation modes. Uh, More space is being created for mixed mode work and other special operating cases. Um, So but everything has to be allowed within a maximum bandwidth of 2.7 kilohertz. Uh, automatic operation requires a special license uh, from the local license authorities and must be coordinated with the operator beforehand. And it's a task that is being performed by AMSAT uh, DL, which I believe is the uh, um, it's either the Dutch or the German. I can't remember the top of my head. On behalf of QSARS and LSAT as well. So uh, we'll put again link on this one for you, so you can check it out. Uh, and say the new band plan for working Oscar 100. Now, there's, of course, a lot of stuff in the news regarding the coronavirus, and it's obviously taken its toll on certain um, events around the world and certainly has uh, uh, curtailed uh, some of the stuff happening in the next few weeks. Uh, we've got uh, an update here from Hamvention. In Hamvention, uh, they're keeping an eye on things uh, and how things are progressing forward. Um, and they say at this moment in time, everything is all systems go, but they say they're keeping an eye on things there. The ICQ podcast are obviously intending to go uh, for this event, but again, we will keep an eye out uh, over the coming weeks and see uh, how our travel plans may be affected. So as always, guys, uh, keep safe and look after your family at this very important time. Right, we move on to our features episode, which is a feature in relation to uh, kit building tips. As always, guys, hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Hi guys, for this episode's feature, I wanted to talk to you about kit building. Now, kit building is something that I do fairly regularly, and over the years I've had a fair amount of success. But I'm hoping to pass on to some of you newbies to the hobby, or people who come into the hobby and want to build kits, a bit of advice. And maybe, for those of you who build kits like me fairly regular, I might have spotted something you haven't, and I'm more than willing for you to tell me things I've missed, because it's this hobby is all about sharing. Now, kits. Well, the first thing you've got to look at is your choice of kit. Now, what would you believe to be a beginner's kit? Uh, in my eyes, what I think is a beginner's kit might not be seen by a beginner as a beginner's kit. So for anybody starting out, Kits come in usually as beginner kits, intermediate or advanced kits. If you're just starting out in the hobby, do not under any circumstances, unless you have an electronics background and you've built lots of uh, electronic kits, stay away from the advanced kits for certain. Now, once you've done that, it's always worth looking at the instruction manual. And often on good quality kits, you can download the uh, instruction manual in advance of purchasing the kit. So if you download the manual and you have a look at it, and you'll uh, get a feel for whether it's within your skill set or not. You'll also get a feel for how well the kit builder uh, has been up to allowing you to get a finished article working without any problems. If they've documented lots of uh, items, well then they obviously want you to end up with a, with a perfectly good working kit. Uh, a colleague of mine, Hans Summers, who I've spoke to on many occasions, uh, produces QRP kits, one but many, uh, but Hans' documentation is uh, really, really good. So what I would always say to people is, have a look at the uh, instructions and see how good they are. Now, the next thing is, lots of kit builders just build a P- P- make a PCB. Uh, so you buy your PCB and components, you put the components in, and it's down to you to fit them in a case. This can be done, and it, what it does make is uh, 
differences. So if I build a kit, and you build a kit, and we put them in different boxes, they look different, and we get a bit of personality into it. However, if this is something you're going to use long term, or if there is a kit uh, box ready for you to put your kit into, a uh, pre-designed box usually makes the item look far more professional and far more usable in the long term. So I would uh, look at seeing if your particular kit you're thinking of making has a case, and if it has, buy the case as well, if that's what you're going to use the device for long periods of time. Now, how are you going to power the kit? Well, most kits these days are low voltage, and that can create problems in other ways as well. Most of our radio gear runs on 13.8 volts. If your kit's a 9 volt uh, device, then you're either going to have to have a separate power supply or a battery and uh, go from there. If uh, you decide to uh, try and run it off the 13.8 volts, then you're going to have to have uh, a voltage regulator of some description to drop uh, down to 9 volts for your one device that's running 9 volts. So look at the power. Okay, if it's mains powered, then maybe you might want to uh, understand whether you're competent uh, working with mains. And if you feel comfortable working on high voltages, then it's up to you. I'm not taking responsibility for you. Do this under your own uh, your own steam. But uh, just think about uh, the power. Now, do you need any special tools for this? Well, there's lots of tools that you have in your toolbox, and over time your toolbox will grow in size, and you will end up with things like third hands for holding devices and, and PCBs and things like that. Very useful, but check the building instructions just in case they require you to have something special before you go ahead. Do you need any test equipment to um, finalise the, the kit build? You know, do you have to test the frequency of something or is there a setup procedure? Most of us have multimeters. So, uh, and if you haven't got one in your amateur radio, then go out and buy one before you sort the kit out and learn how to use it. But make sure that uh, you don't need special pieces of equipment because there's nothing worse than building something, getting right to the end, and you can't use it because you can't set it up. Now, on a timing front, how long will it take you to build it? Well, if you're an impatient person, that's why I say don't go straight for complicated kits. If you're an impatient person, you want to initially start off building something quick. But my advice is take your time. I remember building a Helicraft uh, little QRP tuner, automatic tuner, and I took a probably three times the amount of time that my colleague took to make his. And he was on to me, well, why haven't you finished yours yet? And I, the reason was because I took my time and I sat back and I thoroughly enjoyed the build experience. At the end of the project, mine worked perfectly every time. He then spent a, an inordinate amount of time trying to find the fault, which he man-made faults he put on by rushing to build it. So advice on timing is take your time and build a little bit at a time. If, uh, if you set yourself an hour to work and when that hour's up, you, you put it aside and then carry on another day. You don't rush it and say, oh, I've got to get everything done in an hour because that's um, a recipe for disaster. Who and why are you building the kit for? Well, the most obvious one is you're building it for yourself. But that's not always the case. Some people build uh, kits for contests or to show others what they've made. And, you know, it, it depends. If you're building something for yourself, then maybe putting it in an enclosure that you've designed or you've made might be acceptable. If you're building it to show, then potentially you probably want to put it into a uh, proper case that's been designed for for the device now moving on before we, we start doing too much let's have a quick recap of soldering i've uh, done this before with you guys so i'm not going to labor it too too much but 
There is a saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. And in fairness, when you're soldering, that's probably right. So, you need to clean the PCB before you try to solder onto it. Because it will have little bits of grease and muck. And I know that the flux within the solder will clean the board partially. But why not make your life difficult? So what I would suggest is a little bit of rag and some isopropyl alcohol and wipe, wipe the board over. That gets rid of any um, tarnish and muck and uh, makes the board easier to solder. Clean the components. Now, obviously don't go and clean uh, integrated circuit leads uh, unless you absolutely have to and you're up very, very unlikely. And transistor leads don't tend to, uh, don't tend to corrode. But things like resistors, inductors, capacitors, the leads on them tends to corrode after a while. So it's worth having a very fine emery cloth or, or not so much sandpaper, but very fine abrasive cloth that will just shine up the edges of the, of the leads of the components before you put them into the PCB. Because if you've got a clean PCB and a clean component, when you go to solder it, it should take the solder and make you a good joint. Now, the other one which is the big failing. Make sure your soldering iron is hot enough. If your soldering iron is not hot enough, you have to leave the iron on for a lot longer. That's a recipe for A, damaging components and B, damaging the PCB. So, make sure your iron's hot enough that it'll melt solder quickly. And if you can make if your iron's hot enough, you make a quick solder joint and everything's done quick and it looks far nicer because the solder flows better. Uh, make sure your tip of your iron's clean. You want to make sure it's clean and tinned when you're soldering. And lastly, the type of solder you're using. If you're using either the lead-free solder, which melts at a much higher temperature, in which case you've got to make sure your iron is nice and hot and the solder joints always look a bit dull and a bit off colour, but that's the uh, price we have to pay for not having lead in the solder. If you're lucky enough and still got lead solder, the 6040 lead tin, that flows much nicer over the joints, leaves you with a nice uh, shiny solder connection, and uh, I, I prefer using the lead solder if I can. Now, that's purely down to yourself. You have to make your own decision. So, before we start building, let's start. One thing no, most of us don't like doing is we don't like reading the instruction manual. We are fatal at this. But you really do need to read the instruction manual because often they will tell you something on, say, page 5 or 6 that, that is relevant if you knew about it when you started uh, at page one, would make your life a lot, lot easier. So read the manual through first. Make sure you understand what you want. Make sure you've got all the bits and pieces ready to do this job. Because if you haven't, then frustration comes in. So, you, you know, before you start, read the manual. It is well worth its uh, weight in gold. And we're all guilty of not doing it, including me. But uh, the other thing is to do it. Check you've got all the components. Now, the number of times that uh, I've gone to build a kit, probably 50% of the time, there's at least one component missing. Now, if you are building, say, a transceiver or a piece of kit that you're going to use at the weekend, and it's middle of the week, and you're going to use it at the weekend, there's nothing more frustrating than getting all the way through and finding that... Uh, just before you want to use it, one of the key components is missing. Now, I know most us, us amateurs should have junk boxes, and often I've managed to find a part in my junk box that solved the problem. We shouldn't have to. The part should be in the kit. But from experience, 50% of the kits I've built have had one or more components missing. So for your own sanity, Check all the components are there before you start. And if they're not, drop the uh, kit maker an email or go back to the person who sold it to you and say, can I have one, please, because the one one in my kit. Because you want to end up with a uh, device that's working. 
make sure that um, you have a clean working area to work. Now, I say working area because I'm guilty. I don't have a workbench. I have to build on the wife's kitchen table when she's not there. Make sure you cover it so you don't make a mess. But you need a clean working area for yourselves to do this sort of thing. Other things that are very useful are containers to put components in. So you've gone through and you've sorted out and made sure you've got all your parts. But if there's, say, nuts and bolts and screws, you put them in one container, resistors in another maybe. It depends on how you would do it. I mean, I've seen people use um, polystyrene and uh, or cardboard to put components in or ma manage components by putting them in in areas. But it's whichever way you feel comfortable. Now, component placing. If you've got a good manual uh, of instructions and manual, you will find that the builder will say to you, put this capacitor, this resistor, this what, that, whatever in, and they give you an order to build them. Now, they do that for a reason, uh, because they're obviously either going to test as you go along, or you're going to make sure that uh, you can, it makes it easier for you to build. If you end up with a kit which doesn't have a instructions on how to put it together, just a circuit diagram and a picture, start off with the very low height components, components that are going to sit close to the board. And what you do is you put the components in in height level so that it makes it far easier to solder when you put the uh, board on the table. So I would start off with resistors and uh, inductors that look like resistors. I'd then go to non-electrolytic capacitors. I'd then go to capacitors. And lastly, I'd go for semiconductors. And I'd go diodes, transistors, integrated circuits. Now, if you are putting in an integrated circuit and it has an integrated circuit holder, a chip holder, obviously you can solder that in earlier. But uh, I would leave the semiconductors to last because they're the ones who want the less heat on them, in fairness. Now, it, on a good manual and instructions, they will suggest that you build part of the circuit and you do some tests. Now, they might just be measure the resistance across two points or just apply the voltage on here. Now, I would suggest if they give you a set of instructions that says after you've put X number of components in, you do these tests, do them. Because at least then you know that that part of the circuit or that part of the kit is working. If you build the whole kit without doing the tests as you build, then what happens is you've then got to fault find it. Whereas if you build a part of a kit and you, you test it, and it works, you know that part works. So you can tick that one off easy and uh, move on to your next uh, item. So test as you build is very, very important, especially if it's in the manual. Okay, uh, coming up to completion of your kit, what I'd say is check your work. Have a good look round the board. Double check you put the electrolytics in the right way round, because they do explode. And there used to be a hole in my kitchen ceiling where one went up through the, through the plasterboard. So, uh, you know, make sure you do do a double check on that. That is important. I like to clean any flux off the solder joints where I've uh, soldered them. So I tend to uh, just give them a little scrape with a, with a picker uh, or a dual screwdriver. And then what I like to do is with a toothbrush and some isopropyl alcohol, just uh, scrub the board over quickly and make sure that there's not lumps of flux because sometimes you can get a short circuit hiding under a lump of flux. So that's why I like to clean it off. Double check that uh, you have no short circuits. You can find a lot of faults by just physically looking at them. Make sure that if two wires are apart now, when you put it in the case and the board sits down lower, these two wires don't push together. So make sure you don't have any long ends on things you've soldered because you don't want, when you put the board in a case, to have two tracks or two components short together. 
And the last thing I'm going to say is, I come back to, take your time. When you're making something, take your time. Be proud of what you're making. But last but not least, enjoy building your, your kit. Enjoy it. And once it's working, you'll enjoy it twice as much. I hope this was of interest. The ICQ Podcast. Come for a moment. Stay for an hour. Well, there, as always, guys, hope you got something from our feature there this episode on uh, kit building tips. And uh, certainly, probably very well timed there, Dad, as a feature, because I'm sure many people now are going to be cooped up for the next few weeks around the world. And uh, obviously a great opportunity to maybe have a look at some of the projects they had lined up to uh, to get completed. And uh, as I say, maybe those tips might help uh, some of our listeners uh, to complete their uh, their building ideas. Yeah, well, I'm fetched in me, Colin. I, uh, I obviously decided to do this the other day when I needed some uh, workshop therapy to you know, just sit down in the workshop and build a couple of things. And there were a couple of kits I were given. So, And then I thought, do you know what? Over the years, I've built a number of stuff and... I'll give you some of my tips. Uh, I'm sure lots of other people have got other tips, and I welcome any feedback, um, as we obviously do. But uh, I thought it might be worth doing. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I'm a great believer in the fact you should learn something from somebody every single day. No matter if it's the youngest person, the oldest person, or someone you perceive to be below you or above you or whatever it be, you should, you should try and learn something from somebody. So, guys, there's some uh, great ideas for you about uh, kit building. Uh, but as I say, send in your feedback as well. Uh, do it the usual way, info at icqpodcast.com. Of course, uh, I'm sure it's a, a fit of being a tone throughout today's show. We, guys, we want you all to be safe over the next uh, few weeks. Obviously, worrying times out there around the world. Uh, I'm sure our listeners are uh, being caught up in various ways. Uh, and also, as well, I'm sure ready to uh, maybe be deployed if need be by their uh, their local uh, areas, etc. Uh, so all we can do, guys, is, is to ask you to look after yourselves and your family and the people around you in your communities, etc. Um, as I say, in these uh, troubling times. Now, what helps uh, the ICQ podcast, though, is our donors that help keep us advert free. So we'd like to thank uh, Terry Bradford and David Strachan to Mike Zero Whiskey Hotel X-Ray uh, for their donors this episode, along with their uh, monthly and subscription donors. Guys, those uh, donors keep us advert free. I can't stress enough, you know, I was into a podcast the other day, eight and a half minutes of advertising before the content started. Um, so I say any donations get bring our way, hope certainly keep us advert free and keeps us away from, uh, I say, punting our wares around like other shows do, uh, I say, in that model, which I know you guys appreciate that we don't take advertising. So um, I say go to icqpodcast.com forward slash donate and whatever value you find in the show, uh, send our way. Right, so we got um, to thank Chris, uh, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, and Frank, Kilo4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel for joining you, Dad, on the news round table. I know you were due to go to Hamzilla, uh, but that's been postponed, obviously, for various reasons. Uh, we got a new date, roughly when was it? About October time, would you say? Yeah, 4th of October. So on the 4th of October, uh, it's going to be a busy time for us because... Not only do we do the National Ham Fest, which we're there for, what, two days the week before. Um, the following Sunday after National Ham Fest, I've got uh, Hamzilla. And I'm hoping to find uh, some of the presenters to go with me. Because the week after Hamzilla, we're at the RSGB convention. Well, we're penciled in for the RSGB convention. Um discussions are underway at the moment uh, on what we're going to do at the RSGB convention, but uh, it looks very favourably um, that we will be at the RSGB convention. And I know uh, there's a lot of people that have spoke to me and asked me, will we doing it this year? It's uh, 99% on, I would suggest. No problems at all. Well, there's been a lot of uh, panic buying in Europe. People have been buying toilet rolls and pasta and rice. But more importantly, I really hope you've got a good supply of chocolate biscuits for Mrs. Uh, B, Mum's uh, cup of tea you're about to go off and make her. Yeah, yeah, we can sort bickies from your mum. That's no problem. I mean, she doesn't have lots of bickies. She only has like one with her cup of tea. So she's quite happy with that. So uh, she says it's just a, just that little extra with her cup of tea. But she'll be in from work fairly soon. So uh, I'm... Uh, Going to also uh, go and make that cup of tea. But one last thing on Ham, Hamzilla. Uh, 
I think she's probably the only person who's happy it's been moved because on the, the Saturday before it was going to happen would have been her last day at work when she retires and the clocks jumped forward and she'd have had to been up at silly o'clock in the morning to come with me to Amzilla. So I think she's actually quite pleased it's not happening, even though the rest of us are disappointed. Yeah, true, 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 true. Well, guys, I'm going to reiterate what you said a few moments ago. Please keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, keep your community safe, your club mates safe, your, your fellow amateur and radio operators safe too. Uh, from our end, we'll be back, uh, I say, with another show in a fortnight's time. Uh, so until then, guys, 73s always look after yourself. 73s. Yeah, 73.